to this, taking off the turnbuckle cover, and the fans are calling Austin an asshole. Hey, welcome to Wrestle Reward, the show that looks at whether the wrestle was worth the reward. Clever, right? I'm Justin, and today's episode is made possible by the fine folks at RC Cola presenting us with our Judgment Day, from 2001 to be exact, on May 20th from the Arco Arena in Sacramento, California. Throughout the episode, I'll be giving out very special awards like the Golden Turtleneck, the Don West Creamer, the Gift of the Gods, the Brockberg, the Sign of the Times, the Road Warrior Pop, and a brand new award, so let's start the show. Our opening match sees World Wrestling Federation Commissioner William Regal, sporting a new nickname courtesy of Jim Ross. Facing the man who wears his own Chiron around his waist, Rikishi, who's also getting JR horny on main mere minutes into the show. Rikishi has a rather bodacious bum, I would suggest. This match comes about from Rikishi returning on the May 3rd SmackDown after two months away with a busted eardrum to act as Mr. McMahon's heavy against McMahon rival Undertaker, who also happened to be the man that choke pushed Rikishi off the top of Hell in a Cell five months earlier. Rikishi would return to the ring with a bang, albeit from the steel chair that Undertaker beat him senseless with. The following Monday, Rikishi entered in his tremendous Rikishi wear leather fit as McMahon tried to silence another of his rivals, Mick Foley, by sicking Rikishi on the man who outed him as Stone Cold's car-bound assailant the year prior. Foley used his fancy book writing words to convince Rikishi he was being used as nothing more than a pawn since nobody from Team McMahon helped him on Thursday, causing Rikishi to superkick Foley's replacement as commissioner and carry the torch led by the Nitro Girls with a Monday night dance number. Later in the show, Rikishi faced the man he ran over two years earlier at Survivor Series and lost the match, but the main story was afterwards. Stone Cold attempted to grab a chair for further damage but was blocked by Foley, giving Rikishi time to recover and run off Austin who had accidentally ran Rikishi into his tag team partner Triple H's wife Stephanie McMahon during the match, giving our thick king his chance to wreak havoc onto Stephanie's billion dollar face. One week later, Rikishi awkwardly stood around waiting for Regal to hit his cue and stop a stink face on Kurt Angle, eventually getting it and being laid out for his humiliation of the McMahon regime. Later in the night, Regal announced a match between the two of them for Judgment Day, but was befuddled upon being interrupted by Rikishi's former Too Cool partner, Grandmaster Sexay, who called in a bevy of babes from the front row to celebrate Rikishi's return from the dark side of the ring. That gave us more golden Regal reactions and eventually gave Grandmaster Sexay a Regal cutter, followed by the Regal stretch to send a Regal message to Regal opponent, Rikishi. Regal greets the people of Sacramento with a wave as we find out one of them spent their Saturday night drawing a picture of Rikishi's butt cheeks. Booty butt, booty butt, booty butt cheeks. And then the match begins with a textbook Samoan headbutt to Regal. Rikishi quickly loads Regal into the corner for impending doom, but Regal remembers what else is down there and low blows Rikishi to block Circle from getting that square. The gentleman grappler unleashes some gruff elbows to Rikishi's head and attempts a sunset flip that he didn't think through, but moves in time and makes Rikishi land where the sun don't shine. Regal inspires a young Brian Danielson as he wears maroon and tells the ref he has until 5 on his choke, but soon wishes he had longer with Rikishi reversing the Irish whip into the corner to land a clothesline on Regal. Rikishi connects on a leg drop that I guess didn't hurt his butt even though it was harder than the landing on the sunset flip drop, then charges at Regal in the corner to set him in position once more for the stink face which Rikishi is finally able to apply with some very judgmental commentary from JR towards his personal hygiene. Maybe he wasn't totally wrong though, since that moment leads to this show's GIF of the Gods award winner for most GIF-worthy moment of the night, that being the abject horror on William Regal's face over what it just got pressed into. Regal's night gets worse with a shot into the steel stairs and a savant-like savant kick back in the ring, but Rikishi gets this charge rejected like he's overdraft and crashes into the steel post, giving Regal a better opening than the one he was just trapped in to hit the Regal cutter and send Rikishi back onto the shelf with a shoulder injury until December. After the pin, we see Regal caked in blood from a moment late in the match, which must mean that Rikishi was suffering from one other injury, too. Well, uh, well. with all due respect, he's also suffering from, from anal bleeding. What? Meanwhile, Edge and Christian have a cage-side discussion where Christian is sadly mistaken about his WWE Hall of Fame chances before Kurt Angle appears to ask the latter match veterans for advice on what to do should his and Chris Benoit's two out of three falls match reach its third fall, a ladder match. Number one, falling off sucks, so don't do it. Yeah. Chris Benoit this picture of Kurt Angle from 1998 looked to finally end their rivalry over who the Federation's best pure wrestler is with a 2 out of 3 falls match where the first fall can be won only by pin, the second only by submission, and the third only by climbing a ladder. Chris Benoit avenged his WrestleMania X7 loss to Angle by winning the WWF's first ultimate submission match at Backlash, tapping out Angle in overtime to win 4 falls to 3. Angle took solace in knowing that even if he lost the pro wrestling match, he had gold medals from amateur wrestling in the Olympics that nobody, not even Chris Benoit, could ever take from him. Wouldn't you know that seconds later they got into a fight and Chris Benoit took the gold medals from him. 
Angle's frustrations continued to mount with Benoit beating him two falls to none at UK exclusive pay-per-view Insurrection in a regular two out of three falls match. And two days later, Benoit had the greatest waiter of all time at WWF New York because he tried to tip him 110 ounces of gold medal for his meal during Kurt's match. That distracted Angle and got him bulldozed with a clothesline from hell by Bradshaw before he ran to the parking garage to show how excited he was for Grand Theft Auto 3 later that year by stealing a car to drive from Uniondale, New York to New York City, New York for his medals back. But once Kurt got there, which you know is WWF New York since it says so in the corner, he looked up at the TV screens to see Chris Benoit at Raw, which you know isn't WWF New York since it doesn't say so in the corner. Wearing the olive green shirt that everyone wants action figures of, Benoit convinced Angle to accept his Judgment Day challenge to finally settle their issues, which they'd later make two out of three falls to decide a definitive winner, with the gold medal safely stored until then in his pants. In your pants. <laughs> Still metal clad one week later, Benoit teamed with Jericho against Edge and Christian with the medals carefully placed around Kane's pyro cannon on the ring post. Angle saw an opening and rushed to ringside once both Chris's were down to retrieve the precious, but Benoit revealed after the match that they still had the real medals and Kurt's were only worth as much as the chocolate inside of them. On the final SmackDown before Judgment Day, Angle took Benoit out with an Angle Slam during a tag team match, forcing Kurt to make the difficult decision of whether or not to risk an HR violation by ransacking Benoit's tights for his medals. Eventually he did, finding his pride and joy in being so elated that he forgot where they were as he kissed them, but by then Benoit had stirred and would trap Angle in the crossface, forcing Kurt to tap out after a long holdout and transferring the medals back to Benoit ahead of both men's final Judgment Day. Angle gets the jump on Benoit before the bell even rings as Chris hands the medals to the ref, and then the match begins with Kurt grounding Benoit in one corner and Irish whipping him into another to land a German suplex. Angle hits two more for an even, uneven three and continues trying to beat Benoit at his own game with a flying headbutt, but the only thing that his headbutts is the match. Benoit sees the game being played and hits an angle slam to angle, good enough for three and putting Benoit on the board just like that. Benoit isn't waiting around and jumps right back in to try and win the match with a crossface, but Kurt scrambles for the rope and gets the break. Angle takes a very funny shot into the steel post on the outside, but Benoit misses a chop and gets an even more sensitive spot driven right into the post. Back in the ring, Benoit manages to use his lower body to cut off Kurt's charge into the corner, but trips Benoit down and begins a Robin Hood-esque day trading of attempted submission holds. It ends with Benoit finally catching Angle by the arm with leverage into the mat, but like Robin Hood with GameStop, Kurt puts an end to the fun. Back on his feet, Angle catches Benoit with an overhead belly-to-belly -belly and goes for a sequel, which Benoit doesn't greenlight and instead catches Angle in another crossface. Yet again though, we're treated to a restaurant quality Kurt Angle rope break. Benoit goes for a knee to the gut but gets rolled up with a pin which means absolutely nothing in a submission match, and then Benoit turns that into a brutal looking lion tamer, something picked up from his recent tag team with Chris Jericho. Benoit switches up to a figure four, picked up from his time in the Four Horsemen, but you already know what comes next so I won't even say it. Benoit keeps up the attack with a knee breaker followed by the most underrated move in wrestling, the dragon screw leg whip, into an attempted ankle lock but I get to save my 10th screen cap of Kurt Angle grabbing the rope, something even beginning to wear on JR. These ropes are a woman angle be going steady. Kurt takes back the advantage with a rake to the eyes but loses it right back by getting caught with a DDT. Benoit goes for the whip, but Kurt turns that into an angle slam from its namesake, which he parlays into an ankle lock that forces the tap and evens us at two falls in this two out of three falls match that for some reason didn't use the three stages of hell name. As referee Jack Doan hangs the medals for the authentic Olympic ladder match, Angle's onslaught continues in the background, eventually kicking Benoit out of the ring and driving him into the steel stairs. Angle forgoes that nice looking ladder provided for the match to grab a ratty looking ring crew ladder from underneath the ring, which Benoit demolishes with ease to cut him off. Benoit tosses Angle into the front row and takes out a fan's cane mask in the process, giving himself an opening to ascend the ladder and try to make himself famous by touching the gold, but Angle ends that dream and yanks him right down. Kurt charges with the good ladder but gets back bodied out to the floor, which is also where Benoit jabs him in the gut with it before catching Kurt on the rebound with a shot right to the jaw. Angle powers his way back into the ring for a low blow to stop Benoit from winning, then props the ladder in the corner only to be introduced to his own design when Benoit catches him with a slingshot into the ladder. Kurt tries to avoid a second meeting with the ladder by running up the rungs but gets awkwardly wrapped around it and sandwiched between the mat and the steel. Now it's Benoit's turn to prepare the ladder in the corner, but like with Angle he pays for it by getting run right into the horizontal hunk of steel. Angle tries once again to adjust the ladder to his liking and actually does manage to land a suplex onto it, but is then once more damned by his own creation when Benoit teeter totters the ladder right into his face from the apron. Benoit rams the point of the ladder into Angle's poor face and then sets up shop with the ladder paying Angle to the mat, but apparently Benoit forgot how easily he countered that exact move against Jericho at the Royal Rumble as Angle proves he watches the product by doing exactly that to Benoit. Angle wears down Benoit in the corner with shoulders to the gut but gets caught with another crossface, which Angle is saved by not from a rope break, but from his team ECK members Edge and Christian, whose chief motivation for helping Kurt was for him to stop bothering them about his medals that they didn't care about. 
Benoit does fight back, but it's too late and watches Angle retrieve his gold medals as Benoit pushes the ladder over and after 13 falls on pay-per-view in the last two months, Angle finally wins the war and returns to the medal stand. The latter match follow this bout also wins this show's Brockberg Award for Best Match of the Night, which technically wasn't its own match in just one third of the entire thing, but it's my channel so I can do whatever I want as long as it doesn't involve copyrighted music. Meanwhile, The Undertaker demands that Commissioner Regal make tonight's world title match with Stone Cold a no-holds-barred match so he doesn't get sent to jail for what he does, which I'm not sure would actually hold up in a court of law, but a terrified Regal does grant the request. Then we go coast to coast like a space ghost, from Judgment Day in California to light heavyweight champion Jerry Lynn in WWF New York, but unlike the other superstar patrons there every month, he's not satisfied with the catering because he wanted to be defending his title on the pay-per-view. That leads to a legendary promo that takes home the inaugural McGillicuddy Award for Worst Promo of the Night. From this moment on, this will be the moment, starting now, I get to talk. Well, big whoopity do! How was that, JR? Was my interview okay for you, JR? I give a whole new meaning to the words Judgment Day! The Hardcore Championship takes center stage in a match between The Big Show and The Test, a feud that kicked into second gear when Test helped his friend Shane McMahon to jump off the Backlash stage onto show to win their last man standing match at, wait for it, Backlash. Test first drew McMahon family ally Big Show's ire for comments made about Stephanie McMahon being hit with a twist of fate by Jeff Hardy, which her husband would make Stephanie's ex-fiance pay for dearly on the April 30th episode of Raw's War. A week later at Insurrection on January 6th, I mean May 5th, Test ignored Doctor's orders and wanted to fight Big Show despite his condition, which ended with Big Show giving him Nick Khan's favorite move, the final cut. A new challenger arose though, that being Bradshaw, who thanks to Test recovering enough to hit the best big boot in the business late in the match was able to pin the former WWF champion. With Big Show checked off the Beatrix Kiddo-esque list of Test, he moved on to revenge against Triple H by stopping a post-match attack on Rikishi for a stink face on Stephanie the prior Monday. Big Show took the same plane back to the States from England as Test though and cut him off, but Show would suffer a savat kick from Rikishi and with the Helmsleys fleeing the scene, he left Show all alone to suffer a test endorsed stink face in this intercontinental rivalry. The animosity between these two men is such that Test strikes before Big Show can even get in the ring, though Show would soon get the better of that exchange. Suddenly Rhino wanders out and you might be asking why, well it's because he's the hardcore champion and the centerpiece of this match despite his only involvement with either man being when Big Show avenged his insurrection loss to Bradshaw by helping the man he's now facing retain his title. Rhino gets into a tussle with the seal stairs at ringside to start off, then moves inside to help Tess gang up on Big Show in the corner. Show bursts out of the opposite corner to take both down with a double clothesline and one man gangs up on them, dumping Tess over the ringside barrier and clotheslining Rhino out along with him. Show gets ganged up on again in the crowd as all three brawl to the backstage area, where Show introduces Tess into a pillar not named Kawada. Show goes to work on Rhino next, but gets lasted with a hose around the neck by Tess who chokes him down to his knees. It doesn't keep Show down long though as he soon makes Rhino a hole in the wall. That's the wall up there, brother! and tries pinning Rhino against the wall, which fires up the old debate of whether or not shoulders can be down in mid-air. It's only good for two, so Big Show moves on to test, but has his choke slam off the platform stopped by Rhino so they can combine to punch Big Show a devastating two feet onto some cardboard boxes below, taking Jericho off the hook for blood and guts. Back at ringside, Tess gets sent careening into the steel post by Rhino, who then defies physics by balancing a trash can on the top rope, but he's not as lucky with the trash can lid which Tess punches into his face. An angry Big Show finds his way back into the ring where he choke slams the champion and turns around into the best big boot in the business, but it's only good for two. Rhino lines up for a gore on Tess but takes down the seven footer instead, giving Tess a chance to fish out a fire extinguisher on the outside. He tries to nail Rhino but catches Big Show's goozle, so he thinks on his feet and extinguishes that offensive attempt. Rhino takes a brutal swing at the six footer's head with his magic trash can and then alley oops it to Big Show, who gets slam dunked with a fantastic gore, gore, gore for the unlikely sight of Rhino pinning the seven foot, 500 pound former WWF champion to retain his title, making Taz wonder just how different life could have been for him in the WWF. It's the end of a couple different eras as China defends her women's championship against Lita in what would be the final match of China's storied WWF career and the final women's title match until Survivor Series 2001. After a career made on competing with the men to become the first woman in a Royal Rumble match and the first to be Intercontinental Champion, and two times at that, China was moved to the women's division and dominated Ivory at WrestleMania in mere minutes to win that title. She successfully defended the gold against Ivory a couple weeks later, then against the upstart Molly Holly on SmackDown before rounding out her April by retaining against future ace Trish Stratus in less than 90 seconds. Having run through the bulk of WWF's modest divas division, China announced that she had no competition and as such would be spanking her opponents instead of pinning them going forward as a form of humiliation slash cheap titillation. 
Out came Lita, though, a former women's champion in her own right, who took exception to China's claim and would shoot her shot at a title match that China accepted. Two weeks later, China would team with Lita against Ivory and Molly Holly, and could these two opponents possibly coexist together? It seemed not, with China refusing a tag to keep Lita in the ring, but after Lita was caught with the Molly around, China broke the pin and put Molly down so Lita could hit a moonsault to win the match. Lita was confused as to why China iced her out during the match only to raise her hand after, but China explained backstage that she wanted proof Lita could hang with her, making Lita wrestle two-on-one -on -one as a proof of concept. China would show off later that week on SmackDown by single-handedly defeating the Hall of Fame duo of Ivory and Molly in a handicap match, with Lita raising her hand after as the Game of One Ups Womanship takes us to Judgment Day. The insane pop Lita gets for her arrival wins this show's Road Warrior Pop Award for biggest crowd reaction, with fans passionate for a woman at a time in WWF history not always associated with emotional investment in women's wrestling. Then we get this show's Golden Turtleneck Award winner for Best Fit of the Night with the entrance of China, who had great flair while dressed as a peacock as I watched this very show on Peacock. We see some extremely horny patrons in the crowd who've apparently been very bad. And then the match begins with a hug, which should have been what ROH founded itself upon. A decidedly less tender lockup follows, with China helping Lita back up to continue the theme of sports womanship, but she pays for it with Lita then gaining control and sending China into the corner. China comes back to try a press slam, which is the same move she won at WrestleMania with, but Lita escapes to roll her up for the close call of a two count. Lita follows China's example to offer a helping hand up, but China doesn't have time for that and small packages Lita for a two of her own. China shoots an elbow at Lita to dial up the aggression and begins literally kicking her while she's down, then brings her up to put her right back down with a clothesline. Lita is able to catch China with a tornado DDT and rains down blows on the mat as both women take the metaphorical gloves off. Lita goes to the middle rope for a Thez comma Lou press and does connect, but comes up with another two. Lita evades China, who has an unfortunate wardrobe malfunction that persists for the next minute, but she perseveres through to hit a swinging neckbreaker onto Lita. That's followed by a power slam, which only gets two as China's frustrations grow, but she starts to feel better after finally landing her other slam, the press slam. China gets cocky, peacocky, as she raises Lita's shoulders off the mat herself to stop the three count, but it nearly loses her the match as Lita catches her in a cross arm breaker while wearing some cool eyeball shoes that Seth Rollins surely approves of. China would eventually counter that into a head scissors while back on the stage a familiar face emerges to look on, that being China's former philanderous fiance, Eddie Guerrero. Eddie had recently begun helping Team Extreme with Lita and the Hardy Boys, even sacrificing his spot in the Radicals to gain their trust. Matt Hardy still doubted Eddie, who Hardy had just defeated before Backlash to win the European title, but Guerrero claimed to have a vested interest in seeing his ex-lover lose to Lita, even going as far to take a gore meant for Lita in a mixed tag on Raw. China would also warn Lita not to trust him, adding a personal wrinkle to their otherwise respectful rivalry. Back at Judgment Day, Lita uses her seeing eye shoes to find the rope and force the break, which China reacts to with a violent Greco-Roman hair mare, setting up for a powerbomb that Lita turns into a pin that China just kicks out of. Lita catches China with a kick and goes for the twist of fate, but has her fate sealed with China reversing into a powerbomb to put away the Luchagora and retain her title. Eddie gives China a curious look from the stage as he heads out while China is curious as to what it means before raising Lita's hand in celebration of competition. With Eddie and China both off TV by June and both gone from the company altogether in November, we never got a resolution to any of it and the Women's Championship was officially on ice, a major blow to Hot Girl Summer 2K1. The Big Red Machine Kane is out for red blood against Triple H and is definitely not photoshopped on belts in the first ever Intercontinental Championship chain match. Triple H cost Kane the hardcore title by severely injuring his arm with repeated chair shots before Backlash, where Kane and Undertaker would lose their tag team titles to WWF and IC champions Stone Cold and Triple H with Kane's arm targeted throughout. The two-man power trip ganged up on Taker the night after Backlash, bringing out Kane who looked like he was 30 pages deep on the hub with a broken arm to save his brother, but Austin swiftly ended that hope with a chair to the head followed by repeated blows to the arm on the floor and against the stairs. Much to Stone Cold's surprise, Kane returned two weeks later on SmackDown and was finally able to stop an assault on Taker by wiping out the Texas Rattlesnake himself. A frustrated Triple H wanted to finally end his Kane problem and offered a chain match to do so in, wanting Kane to get a taste of the medicine that the power trip had been getting force-fed by The Undertaker. Triple H gave us a preview by ending a two-on-one match against Kane by attacking him with a chain, and with Undertaker absent due to an alleged family emergency, Kane was left all alone to be decimated one final time before Judgment Day by the world WWF Intercontinental Tag Team Champions. Oh my god, the stage is on fire! Somebody go please- Oh, yeah. It's just Kane's entrance video. Kane arrives with his own chain in hand, but is forced by referee Earl Hebner to put the hashtag Kane chain away, opening the door for Triple H to strike with the official chain to officially begin the match. Kane's bad arm gets hit with more steel, getting wrapped around the ring post while Stephanie's bloodlust at ringside begins to bubble. Hunter finds another piece of steel, this one in chair form, to bash Kane in the back with, which doesn't seem so bad. I mean, it could have been... Oh, okay, that's much worse, yeah. 
The cerebral assassin gets around to latching the chain onto Kane, making sure to hook it onto the bad arm, then goes outside to just try and rip Kane's hand right off his arm. Triple H pulls Kane into this mesh's fourth type of steel, the stairs, while Stephanie becomes even more crazed looking ahead of Triple H tag teaming Kane's arm with the chain and stairs. Hunter confiscates the timekeeper's chair, but takes his eye off the cane sized ball and gets pulled by the steel chain into the steel ring post against the steel chair. Stephanie's tune suddenly changes when she actually does see blood, with her husband pouring it from the impact of his head going into the chair and ring post. Kane violently bends Triple H backwards, choking him with the chain, and only makes it worse on the game by hanging him from the ropes with it. We get a great shot of Stephanie watching her man's destruction before finally catching a break with Triple H using the chain to rip Kane off the top rope. Kane blocks a shot into the barricade, which does have steel under the padding, to clothesline Hunter over and into the crowd, but Kane once again forgets to set his feet and Triple H yanks him into the guardrail. Kane manages to catch Triple H atop the rail and drop him to the floor, but once back inside gets caught with a pedigree attempt that Triple H nearly lands until Kane tips him over and drives the chain into Triple H's tip. Kane finally hits that top rope clothesline with the chain and goozles the game for his turn to finish off the match, looking primed to by actually landing the chokeslam. That brings out Triple H's tag title partner Stone Cold though, who eats an extra crispy big boot, but it gives Triple H enough time to recover for a low blow in the corner. Stone Cold tries to help with a chair shot, but somehow ends up smacking Triple H in the face despite Kane being bent over the entire time. Kane catches Austin in the face with a shot of his own and falls into a cover that scores a 3 to give Kane his first Intercontinental Championship and some long overdue revenge while putting the two-man power trip's cohesion into question. The co-main event of the night is actually six different matches inside of a number one contender's tag team turmoil, beginning with former champions the APA of WWFAPA.com and always pounding ass fame, going up against Dean Malenko and Perry Saturn with Perry's incredible Technicolor robe and furry hat. The match begins with a close call of an overhead suplex to Farouk, followed by a double down with both Saturn and Farouk nailing clotheslines. Dean Malenko comes in to attack Farouk and more importantly draw Bradshaw away from the apron to stop attack, which gets Malenko chucked to the floor. Saturn capitalizes with a suplex on Bradshaw, but the glory is short-lived with Farouk nailing one of his awesome spine busters and pinning Saturn before Malenko can break it up to eliminate the radicals in rapid fashion. Out next are the boys of Dudley, who decide to preen to the crowd first and pay for it by getting attacked from behind by the APA. Farouk follows up by catching Devon with a power slam and tagging Bradshaw in to knock Bubba's block off with a double shoulder block. Bubba gets his family back into things by hoisting up Bradshaw for a sidewalk slam and a double team shot of their own. Devon launches at Bradshaw for a clothesline but hops one time too many and gets caught by the big man to be planted with a fallaway slam. Bubba stops a superplex attempt on Devon by collecting Bradshaw on his shoulders for Devon to instead connect with a doomsday deadly device, and with Mike Yoda inexplicably turning his back to yell at Bradshaw on the floor, Devon hits the other deadly high spot on Farouk, the Wazab headbutt. Bubba calls for it in the ring and Devon goes outside to prepare a table because the Dudley boys live in a self-correcting universe where they must get the tables even if it would get them disqualified, but they pay for it when Hardcore Holly comes from behind to Alabama slam a Devon through his own table. The reason for the attack is over the start of Wrestling's Greatest Romance when Hardcore's cousin Molly Holly told Devon's half-brother Spike how impressed she was by Spike winning a tables match by putting the mass of humanity Albert through a table. Molly's other cousin Crash took exception to that and flaunted his 14 Hardcore title reigns, leading to a match later that night where Spike pinned the 14-time champ 1-2-3, much to Hardcore Holly's dismay. Crash revealed the following Monday that the real reason he didn't want Molly around Spike was because of the Dudley family history of putting women through tables, but Molly insisted that Spike was different from his brothers. Spike wanted to prove her right and tried helping Crash become a 15-time Hardcore Champion, but Spike got flung into Crash in his trash can by Rhino, costing Holly the match and causing a fight afterwards between the two. Hardcore Holly found a treadmill in the middle of a hallway on SmackDown, and while getting his cardi win, told Molly that he agreed with Crash about needing her to stay away from the Dudley Boys. Bob would do his part to run off Spike by rocking him with an Alabama Slamma to win their match later that night, but Bubba and Devon refused to take the hint and 3 would Crash after the match to defend Spike's honor. Fast forward back to Judgment Day where the distraction from Devon going through the table leaves Bubba open for a clothesline from hell and that's all she wrote for the Wizards of the Wicked Wood, bringing us to our next team. Yo, you dealing with the X Factor. I got everything I ever Yo. wanted. The arrival of X Factor also gives us Bradshaw and Farouk in bisexual lighting, followed by the equally beautiful sight of an Xbox spinning heel kick. Farouk fires back with a whip into the corner and a backbreaker that he gets a two count off, but the real highlight here is the payoff to the night long thread between JR and Paul Heyman that wins the Don West Creamer for best commentary of the night. He missed the frog splash, Mike, and creamed himself out! The last man to hold the ECW title! What happened to the ECW title? He never got defeated for it! The Dudley Boys, eight time ECW tag team Whoa. champion! Three times WWE tag team champion! Power slam! And I sure as hell don't trust just incredible who was I'm sure an ECW champion of some. I don't matter if that's why. But that's the 
besides the point. Xbox luck gets worse with Bradshaw tagging in and dropping him with a back suplex, but after tagging out to Farouk, Just Incredible shockingly gets the better of the former WCW champion. That gives way to X-Pac returning to massage Farouk with shots in between the shoulder blades, but unfortunately for X-Pac, Farouk's massage technique is a bit rough around the edges. That allows Farouk to tag in Bradshaw, who loads up X-Pac and big boosts Justin right in his hands, but Albert catches Bradshaw with the heel manager special and holds down the burly Texan long enough for X-Pac to score three and advance Simon Cowell's favorite tag team. Out next are two-thirds of another WWF trio, the Hardy Boys, but it's rough waters early on with X-Pac bending the top rope and leveraging Jeff into an unintentional moonsault to the floor. It gets even worse for Jeff when his boys meet the ring post head-on, though Albert and his extremely tanned arms graciously escort Jeff back into the ring. We get the most cursed image of this show with a close-up of clean-shaven X-Pac, but he wishes he had his beard to protect him from Jeff's double dropkick into his jaw. Matt tags it and also hates X-Pac's smooth face, and apparently just incredible smooth head too since he gets sent off the apron so the Hardys can deliver poetry in motion to X-Pac. Jeff follows up with a swanton that would be good for three, if Albert didn't yank Matt out of the cover, but he pays for it with Jeff hurling himself over the top rope onto Albert below. Matt goes for a twist of fate on X-Pac, but Just Incredible catches him with a super kick and once again proves you don't need a summer of punk when you have the spring of X-Factor right here. The next team in is Chris Jericho along with his surprise partner who wasn't really a surprise if you watched them team up every other week on TV for the past two months, Chris Benoit, competing in his fourth different match type of the night after three different one-on-one -on -one matches against Kurt Angle earlier in the show. Jericho doesn't waste any time taking Albert off the apron, but he fails Peter Tamarkin by pressing his luck too far and getting caught by Albert on the floor, then driven into the ring post. x gets in a stretch and a big boot all-in-one on Benoit before setting him in the corner and motioning for a Bronco Buster, but Benoit offers him a different seat instead that keeps x down long enough for Benoit to tag out. Jericho comes in with a missile dropkick but wipes out referee Mike Kyoto after x ducks the forearm. X-Factor bucks Jericho's momentum with a super kick party, but even with a new referee in, it's only good for two. The groin of X-Pac takes further abuse with Benoit tripping him on the top rope and then Just Incredible going head-to-head -head with a slingshot into X-Pac that knocks him to the floor. The Canadian Chris's, Chris I, catch Albert running in to hit a double suplex then double suplex Just Incredible onto Albert before locking in double submissions to double tap X-Factor and win the fall. And the last team to enter is fittingly one that features an ultimate opportunist with the team of Edge and Christian arriving to pay off the main story heading into this match. E&C wanted to help the K and Team ECK, Kurt Angle, get his gold medals back from Angle rival Benoit, causing a brawl into the trainer's room where Benoit's recent ally Jericho was receiving treatment and jumped in to help send the other Canadians packing. That led to a tag team match with those pairs the next week on Raw, won by Jericho and Benoit with a lion salt by one long blonde haired Canadian onto another. Y2J celebrated his win over the new thorns in his side, but those thorns kept poking as Jericho got jumped and walloped with a concussion causing concerto backstage. Jericho faced Edge later that week, but wasn't as lucky with the Lion Salt this time and ate a chair that allowed Edge to win the WrestleMania 26 preview match. Jericho is fed up with this world, and wanted to torment e c like they had him, bound to enter tag team turmoil at Judgment Day even without knowing who his partner would be. Back in Sacramento, all that tension boils over with everyone brawling around the ring, but e c take over with a hot shot across the top rope on Y2J. Christian turns him over and adds a backbreaker, but Jericho remembers to hook the rope on an Irish whip from Edge so we can watch him fall back to earth on the dropkick attempt. Jericho sees an opening, but Edge's knees shut the window closed, and ENC try to one up the Hardys with poetry in motion, but the stanzas don't quite line up for Christian. Y2J follows up with a bulldog to Edge and finally reaches his corner for a tag to Benoit where it doesn't get any better for ENC as Edge gets run into Christian, who then gets a doomsday dropkick that also lands Benoit on his own partner. Edge is able to dodge a Jericho charge in the corner though and he crashes into the steel ring post, inspiring e c to grab some more steel from ringside. Chris and Chris tell e c to take a seat with stereo baseball slide dropkicks and grab the chairs themselves for a concerto, but Edge shaves Christian with a spear and Benoit gets rolled up for a near fall. Edge grounds Benoit with the clothesline and the originators of the concerto start warming up, but Jericho yanks Edge down into his chair while Benoit ducks Christian and locks in the crossface, forcing the tap and finally ending Benoit's night with five matches, three wins, and one tag team title shot. After Triple H vs. Kane earlier in the night, the second half of the two-man power trip vs. Brothers of Destruction feud headlines Judgment Day with Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Undertaker battling each other over the WWF Championship for the 11th and final time in pay-per-view history. Stone Cold retained his WWF title and added a tag team one when he and Intercontinental Champion Triple H defeated the Brothers of Destruction and Backlash, but the issue was far from over with Stone Cold forced by CEO Linda McMahon to defend the WWF title against The Undertaker 24 hours later on Raw. Taker was supremely confident, saying that Stone Cold knew he couldn't beat The Undertaker, which is completely true except for all the times in the last three years when it absolutely wasn't true. The latest meeting lasted all of 59 official seconds and Taker did win, but only when Triple H caused a DQ by running in for a sledgehammer to the back of the head. 
Austin tried to stop Taker from following him around by taking a steel chair to his motorcycle afterwards, but he wouldn't get off that easy since Undertaker hopped the rail on SmackDown to attack Austin with a chain while not spilling a drop of Taz's Pepsi, a luxury not always afforded to commentators. The fight continued backstage with Taker launching Austin through a glass window, forcing the WWF Champion to receive medical attention for glass in his eye, but better that than a thorn in your eye. Stone Cold was loaded into an ambulance to be transported to a local medical facility, but there was just one problem with that plan. Driver, go! Hell, boys! Undertaker would attack Austin like the sitting and strapped duck he was until security pulled him away as Stone Cold felt the consequences of karma in doing the same thing to Bret Hart four years earlier on Raw's War. Stone Cold's wife Deborah was none too pleased and slapped the American badass, something she would regret a week later when The Undertaker took Stone Cold's locker room hostage and rebuffed Deborah's attempt to make him leave by adding a chewing tobacco accent to her white jacket. The Undertaker enjoyed the perks of the World Champion's locker room before Commissioner William Regal tried his hand at chewing Taker away, but The Undertaker told him to hit the showers. I guess it's true what they say, tobacco is wacko, if you're a teen. Yeah, or a British guy. Four days later on Raw, a detective for the local law enforcement facility revealed that Undertaker left the arena due to his wife being in a car crash, which left Taker's brother Kane all alone for the tag title rematch with the power trip. That match ended with another intentional DQ and another destruction of a brother of destruction, with Austin seemingly revealing afterwards that the car crash was a hoax. Later that week on the final SmackDown Before Judgment Day, Undertaker found out what the thing he was talking to the cops on was called, and also found out that the calls to the police on Monday came from inside the house. I mean, from Triple H's cellular telephone. What are you doing with a cellular telephone, son? Everybody's got one, Sheriff. Commissioner Regal was appalled at Triple H's actions and stood up to him, ordering a no-DQ match with The Undertaker, news even more upsetting to Stephanie than the walker stealing her outfit that day. Undertaker was ready to give Triple H his literal last ride to the floor, but Stone Cold appeared on the Ovaltron to call Undertaker's wife and reveal it was him, Taker. It was him all along, Taker. Proving true the theory that you either die a hero or live long enough to repeat the villain's dialogue as your own in a fleeting attempt to save your heel turn. Speaking of Vince, he arrives to reclaim his throne on commentary at Judgment Day along with JR and Paul Heyman, who really wants Vince to smack JR. Next out is The Undertaker of Undertaker.com, who instantly jumps Stone Cold Steve Austin of StoneCold.com to kickstart the match. Taker helps a fan in his disposable camera at ringside get an in-person screenshot of his choke on Austin before chucking his bandana at the chairman. Austin crashes into the stairs hip first to make wrestlers everywhere wince and then gets dunked into the floor with an old school off the rail. As the brawl moves up yonder, we spot this show's Sign of the Times award winner for best sign of the night with this fan bravely taking the first step in tackling addiction by admitting it on global pay-per-view. Stone Cold gets a rear view from the fire extinguisher and then misses two clothesline attempts on Taker to get dropped with a jumping one himself from the dead man. Taker tries to dig an early grave for Austin with a tombstone, but Stone Cold escapes and attempts a stunner only to be introduced to Undertaker's large boot. Taker offers Austin the taste of steel instead of boot with a shot to the post and then runs off Vince who uses the Spanish announced team as a shield, but that distracts Taker and gives Austin a chance to land a shot from behind. Stone Cold returns the favor around the ring post, then attacks the knees of Undertaker again. And again. And again. After three and a half minutes of that, Austin lets up to stand and deliver a pair of low blows, and then goes right back to the legs. The Stone Cold obsession eventually costs him with Taker's endless loop of leg lariats, allowing him to get up and clear Vince's table at ringside, which Howard Finkel wants no part of. Austin gets chokeslammed through the table in front of his last three bosses, but Undertaker doesn't want the Spanish announced team to feel left out and pushes the headset off of Carlos Cabrera while in pursuit of Vince. That distraction once again gives Austin a chance to get back into the match though, this time with a monitor shot. Stone Cold disrobes the top turnbuckle back in the ring, while on the side of the ring Taker begins to pour blood before getting clotheslined right back down. Like a shark in the water that's also a rattlesnake, free idea sci-fi, Austin smells blood and unleashes hell on Undertaker to further open the wound. Austin keeps up the attack with a Fez comma Lou press and then nails one of 2001 WWF's favorite spots, the behind the back low blow. Taker finally turns the tide by suplexing Stone Cold out of the sleeper hold, but the high tide washes away Taker in the form of a steel chair to the skull. Taker gives Stone Cold a familiar salute in response, so in response to the response, Austin gives him a familiar finisher, but Taker responds to the response of the response with a kick out at two. Austin tries to crack Taker's ribs with the chair but gets dinged in the gonads followed by a chokeslam to the back. 
Taker keeps after the back with repeated chair shots to it, which Bat signals Triple H out with his sledgehammer in hand. He gets greeted with a chair to the head in the ring and Austin walks up to get one too, but Vince breaks up the pin to save his investment. Stone Cold once again shows what a horrible shot he is by nailing Vince with the chair instead of Taker, but Triple H cleans up the mess with his sledgehammer to continue the story from earlier that he's the glue holding the two-man power trip together. With everyone down, Kane's pyro sounds to signal he's not going to take this sitting down, but Austin becomes the first wrestler to see a running coming and just keep doing what he was doing by pinning Taker for three and making Kane look like a massive geek. The two-man power trip starring Trips leads with one less belt than they came into the show with, but with the most important one still intact while well, Undertaker points to the Sarah tattoo on his neck to remind us who he let down by losing as we fade to black on Judgment Day 2001. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Wrestle Reward. Remember to like, subscribe, comment, tweet, flee, Instagram, Facebook, email, WhatsApp, ProBoards, and everything else this video. See you next time!